And now it's time for the sponsor perspective portion of the program. Before we get going, a quick clarification. While I'm conducting the interview and these questions are mine, the content of this portion shouldn't be considered editorial. With that, I'm really pleased to welcome Steve Ubel, president and CEO of Pharma, the trade association representing the nation's leading biopharmaceutical research company. Steve, it's great to see you. Look, everybody wants to know what is coming down the pike. We've been through a stressful time. Uh, people may not realize that things are moving faster than they ever have before towards a vaccine during the time of COVID. But can you give us, a, you know, both a dashboard and a playbook of where we are in the COVID story as far as America's leading pharmaceutical companies are concerned? Well, thanks, Steve. It's a delight to be with you again. You know, when we were together last, I think it was back in the summer, I talked with guarded optimism about the industry efforts related to you know, repurposing existing medicines to treat uh, COVID-19, developing new therapeutics, and of course, a vaccine. And if you fast, fast forward to today, um, I think we can speak with even more enthusiasm as a lot of these industry efforts are now coming to fruition. You know, back then, physicians really didn't have a lot of treatment options for those who'd been infected, uh, aside from supplemental oxygen or ventilation. Uh, today, the toolbox that physicians have to treat those that are already infected uh, is growing uh, literally by the day. You have antivirals like remdesivir. Uh, we have anti-inflammatory agents. Uh, we have um, anticoagulants because we know blood clotting uh, is, is an effect of the disease. Uh, we just recently had emergency use authorization for monoclonal antibodies. Uh, which are literally an immune system in a bottle uh, and have shown that they can keep patients out of the hospital in the first place. So, so we have a lot in the physician toolbox to treat those who are already infected. And of course, on the vaccine, we stand on the cusp of FDA considering uh, two vaccines uh, that, that could have 95% effectiveness uh, in less than a year uh, which is really a stunning scientific accomplishment. Uh, a lot of work to do, obviously, as we uh, move into manufacturing and dissemination of these vaccines, and we'll likely see additional vaccines come online uh, as we move into next year. Um, but we can begin to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Obviously, it's still a very challenging environment as cases multiply around the country and around the world, uh, but we can begin to see the light at the end of the tunnel. You know, I, I know that this may be an awkward question because these are your members, but have you ever seen a time in your you know, life and tenure in this field where corporations and the government have worked like this in this pattern so quickly in such a focused way? I'm really proud of the way the industry is, is literally working 24 seven on uh, therapeutics and a vaccine and, and collaborating in and new and different ways that are really unprecedented. Uh, we've had a terrific uh, collaboration uh, with the government, uh, both with the FDA, NIH, and, and other stakeholders. You know, companies are sharing um, information in real time. You know, they've developed master clinical trial protocols so that we don't have to have separate individual uh, trials. Um, we're sharing patient level information that we might typically share on clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, that might have a substantial lag associated with it. We're, we're sharing patient level data uh, in real time from these clinical trials and even manufacturing capacity. We have a situation where one of our member companies has said, if there's a, uh, an approved therapeutic or vaccine, I will donate excess manufacturing capacity uh, to manufacture a product that a competitor of mine uh, might get approved. So. I think it really is unprecedented, and a lot of these lessons learned, I think, uh, will be brought to bear on uh, future research uh, of other diseases. Look, like any crisis that hits this country, whether it's a financial crisis, as we saw in 2008, 2009, or a pandemic, the hardest hit communities in this country are the ones without the resources and networks that the wealthiest folks have. Uh, and those are often communities of color. And so I guess my question to you is, you know, there's also some trust deficit in, 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 in these various communities. So as you approach it and think about things from clinical trials to health equity, to getting, you know, trust in these communities of vaccines, what are some of the steps you're putting in place to address those quadrants of our equation in the country? 
Yeah, Steve, you're so right. I mean, COVID-19 has really laid bare a, a lot of the health inequities that, that plague our health system and our society. And um, we know as an industry, we have work to do uh, to build trust in, in black and brown communities and, and to serve those communities better. You know, recently Pharma released um, historic new principles around in, improving and enhancing diversity in clinical trials. Um, and uh, really it's a, it's a playbook, it's, it's best practices for how to do outreach in these communities and how to improve recruitment and retention uh, in enrollment in clinical trials. And the good news is, if you look at the COVID trials that have been conducted, you know, Pfizer and Moderna, for example, they've done a very good job of, of reaching out into communities of color and, and, and making sure that their clinical trials are diverse. So Moderna, for example, um, I believe had 11,000, uh, you know, diverse uh, individuals in their clinical trial, which is about 37 to 40 percent, I believe, of their trial population. That's roughly parallel to the uh, you know, diverse population um, as a whole. And Pfizer had, had similar uh, composition of its clinical trials. So that gives us momentum to build on. Uh, but there are clearly gaps that still need to be addressed. I'll give you one uh, example. Uh, if you look at type 2 diabetes, we know that Asians, Blacks, and Latinos um, are overrepresented in that disease area. They represent about 35% of the disease population in the U.S. But if you look at the clinical trials, only about 20% of clinical trials have been studied uh, in those three populations. So about four medicines of all the medicines in the type two class have been tested in those, those key populations. So we know there are gaps. Cancer is another example where uh, Hispanics uh, chronically underrepresented about two, represent about two and a half percent of clinical trial participants and about 11% of the US population as a whole. So at Pharma, we're, we're looking to really close those gaps and are examining not only our, our uh, principles, uh, which lay out best practices, but really going out into the community and listening uh, to the, those that have reservations about participating in clinical trials and rebuilding that trust. Stephen, I want to get into the incoming Biden administration in a moment. But before I do that, I, I know you've been dealing with um, government officials to sort of think about what does the rollout of this vaccine look like, which is going to be a mammoth communications responsibility to lots of different parts of American society, really the global uh, society, if you will. But, you know, in thinking about how you communicate, what's rolling out, how we deal with this, has anyone, are, are you part of those conversations uh, and looking at what the communication is? How, or do you feel that that's a robust enough con uh, uh, conversation? Do, do you have confidence that that rollout in communications is going to get the investment it needs to get it right? I do. You know, it all starts with assuring your viewers uh, that our companies uh, are committed to the, you know, the gold standard of FDA review. There have been no corners cut in the development of these therapeutics and a vaccine. Uh, our vaccine manufacturers actually made a pledge not even to submit to the FDA until they had, you know, completed phase three uh, data. We've welcomed FDA guidance at every step of the process. So it all starts with assurance of, of safety and effectiveness, and, and it's going to be assisted greatly by this compelling uh, data. I mean, if you look at a, a vaccine that has 95 percent effectiveness, it's roughly akin to the measles vaccine at 98 percent mm. effectiveness. It's really a stunning scientific accomplishment. But we're now moving into a phase where we're focused on manufacturing and, and distribution. And as you pointed out, reaching out to the various communities uh, to ensure uh, that, that the outreach is done in a way to encourage people to get vaccinated. And uh, I'm encouraged that we've seen a, a, a steady uptick in uh, confidence levels around or people expressing a uh, willingness uh, to obtain the vaccine and get, get vaccinated. But pharma is going to be engaging with a wide range of stakeholders uh, and the government, as well as others, to um, really drive um, outreach and awareness around the vaccine in the coming months. You know, soon it'll start in, in hospitals and long-term uh, care uh, settings, but eventually you're going to be able to walk to your, your CVS or Walgreens and get a vaccine in the very near future.
Thanks, Steve. Well, we're at another inflection point in American political history. A new administration is coming in. It is coming in. Uh, what are you hoping to do with the Biden administration in, you know, to share with them uh, and, and to work with them on as, as they come in? And I want to ask this with regards to, you know, not just COVID and the pharmaceuticals, but really you and I have talked so many years over the question of the health of the science ecosystem in this country. Um, you know, and again, you know, the pharmaceutical industry is, you know, a way saving us in this pandemic, but it doesn't stop there. So, I mean, what, do you, what are you hoping to raise with Biden uh, and his team? And, and uh, where is that going to go? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. You know, as we've talked about before, uh, we have the secret sauce in the U.S., around a robust innovation ecosystem. And if you look at the COVID vaccine story, again, which is remarkable, if you looked at the SARS epidemic, it took almost two years to get the first candidate vaccine into the clinic and the human trials. And here we are again on the cusp of a vaccine inside a year. Um, that shows what a robust uh, private sector biopharmaceutical industry can produce uh, if we continue to nurture uh, the policy environment and the innovation ecosystem uh, that led to its creation it literally took decades of investment in research and technology to enable the industry to move as quickly as it has uh, on the COVID front. You know, we look forward to working with the Biden administration as they articulated at a high level what their priorities are. The top three are priorities that we're plugging into immediately. They're focused on COVID. They're focused on the economy. They're focused on racial equity. We've talked about all those subjects uh, today in the context of this interview. We look forward to working with them as they appoint their, their health care uh, leaders. I will say with regard to drug pricing, you know, we've done some polling in the wake of the election and 70 percent of Americans say that it's a bigger problem that they're paying more for their insurance and getting less for it than believe that the cost of prescription medicines is the overriding problem in our health care system which is why we've been very focused on, on very specific concrete reforms that would lower what patients pay at the pharmacy counter. Uh, and we're gonna continue to engage policymakers on a bi bipartisan basis uh, to move in that direction. So things like capping out-of-pocket costs in the Medicare program, lowering cost sharing, spreading the cost burden uh, throughout the calendar year so people don't have uh, issues at the beginning of the year before they meet their deductible sharing rebates and discounts with patients at the, at the pharmacy counter. These would all be concrete steps that would lower what patients pay uh, for their medicine. We're not for the status mm. quo. We know that too often patients struggle to afford their medicine, but there's a right way and a wrong way to solve those, those issues. And hopefully we'll focus on those, those pocketbook issues that, that voters and seniors are telling us they care most about. Well, listen, we host these conversations, or I should say we organize them, because these are consequential conversations. These are not easy topics. They're tough topics. They're hard to get right. I really appreciate your candor, Steve Ubel, President and CEO of Pharma, for sharing with us where we are uh, on the, uh, the COVID story now uh, and where we're going in the future. Thanks so much for hanging out with us for a bit today and also supporting today's conversations. Thanks, Steve.